<laughs> How many of you are familiar with this image here? Not a lot of you. OK, so this is one of my favorite images from one of my favorite spacecrafts, Voyager 1. And if you can see that little pale blue speck of a pixel there, that's actually Earth as seen from about 4 billion miles away. So that's where you can find me if you need me. <laughs> but the reason why I love this image so much is because it shows us how space exploration often changes our view of ourselves and our place in the universe. But similarly, I think we should change how we view space exploration. And this is what a lot of my work focuses on, hacking space exploration. But it would be more accurate to call it hacking space observation because that's really the relationship that most of us have with space exploration. We're often observing astronauts and government agencies exploring on behalf of us, but we ourselves aren't doing much exploring. And this relates to my own personal story because a few years ago I was watching a great documentary called When We Left Earth. And it's this great documentary about NASA during the early days and how they were trying to figure out how to send humans into space for the first time. I found this documentary so incredibly inspiring that I decided to send someone at NASA, someone I had never met, <laughs> an email saying that I was a huge fan of what they were doing, and if they ever needed someone like me, someone who has no science background whatsoever, <laughs> I went to art school and got my degree in graphic design, um, if they ever needed someone like me, uh, that I was here. I didn't ever expect to hear back from that email. Uh, it was definitely a geeky fangirl moment, but uh, serendipitously, I was able to get a job at NASA from that email. <laughs> <laughs> and it was absolutely amazing and completely changed my life. It, it, was, it was a huge, huge fangirl moment. And so I wanted to share with all of you just a quick clip from this documentary that better explains why I found it so inspiring. And so you'll see a lot of rockets in this documentary. A lot of these rocket, all of these rockets actually are uncrewed uh, as NASA was trying to figure out how to send humans into space. To beat the Soviets, NASA must launch a man into Earth orbit. Only rockets can go fast enough. We knew nothing about rocketry. We knew nothing about spacecraft. We knew nothing about orbits. I saw a lot of rockets launched. I'd say that somewhere between 30 and 40% of them failed. A lot of them came up off the pad and went the opposite direction. Some of them got halfway off the pad and blew up. Some of them got to 10,000 feet and turned the other way and blew up. The whole thing crumbled and blew up. It looked like an atomic bomb went off almost over our heads. We got a big kick out of watching the Mercury astronauts. It was great looking at their eyes. looking at this thing and looking at each other and deciding we want to go back and talk to the engineers a little more before we go further. And so that's what I love so much about that documentary. It actually always reminds me of this image here. <laughs> that NASA didn't exactly know what they were doing. They were figuring it out as they went along. You, you heard them talking about how they didn't know anything about orbits or rocketry or spacecrafts. And I was watching this and saying to myself, well, I don't know anything about space exploration and I want to work at NASA. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I got that chance. Uh, and it really changed my view of uh, NASA from being a bunch of rocket scientists to being a bunch of space hackers, that they were really figuring things out as they went along and trying things out. And it really changed my own relationship with science because doing something changes how you see it. So actually doing science and doing space exploration actively changes your relationship with it from something of observation to something of active participation and contribution. And so while working at NASA, I got to learn a lot of great things about dark matter and robots and all this great stuff. It was like getting paid to go to school. But one important thing that I ended up learning was that I didn't need to be an astronaut to explore space. An even more important thing that I ended up learning at NASA was that I didn't even need to work at NASA to explore space. And so I left. <laughs> 
and I created spacehack.org, which is a directory of ways for anyone to participate in space exploration. These are things people can do with or without a formal science background that actively contribute to the furtherment of space exploration. So things like uh, discovering black holes or discovering galaxies or building the next generation of Mars rovers. And so what I've really learned from my journey uh, throughout all of this is that it, this is all really about making massively multiplayer science. And what that means is really, it's about disrupting science, really making science disruptively accessible. And how you do that is through actually instigating unusual collaborations between people to actually create clever creations for science and space exploration. Ivory towers can absolutely get by by sticking to a narrow path and not engaging in multidisciplinary collaboration. But to me, to forfeit all of those countless clever creations that can come out of multidisciplinary collaboration is to be reckless. So since that time and since learning all of this, institutions are beginning to learn this and, and beginning to learn the importance of making massively multiplayer science. And in one project, uh, they did this uh, where people actually wanted to explore how to 3D scan supernovas. But 3D scanning supernovas is not exactly easy because you can't necessarily take a 3D scanner and point it to the sky and hope to get a scan of a supernova that way. Um, and you can't exactly put a supernova and shrink it down and put it through an MRI machine and get a 3D scan of it that way. But that's essentially what a group of researchers at Harvard did. They actually used open source software called 3D Slicer that usually takes MRI data and creates sort of 3D fly-throughs for brain scans, and they took that, and instead of using brain scans, they actually fed it supernova data. So they actually fed it this supernova here, Cassiopeia A, and what they were able to create was this. This is the very first 3D fly-through of a supernova remnant that was ever created. And so this is through a project at Harvard called the Astronomical Medicine Project, and the astro Astronomical Medicine Project is a project that actually tries to get the astronomy department and the medicine department to work together to produce cooler visualizations, better solutions, and really clever things for science. So now, years after working at NASA, I find myself back at NASA again, advising a program that also understands the importance of, importance of taking risks and actually exploring multidisciplinary collaboration. And that program is NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts, also known as NIAC. And NIAC is the only program at NASA that funds the more futuristic, out there, sci-fi-like concepts that could actually go on to transform future space missions. And so some of the things NIAC has funded have been things like the Comet Hitchhiker, which is a concept for a spacecraft that would actually go to a comet and uh, put a huge tether into this comet and reel it out and actually harvest the kinetic energy of this comet to be able to explore the solar system twice as fast as any of our current spacecrafts. Other projects they funded have been things that actually tap into computer vision. So actually using computer vision to route rovers on the moon to stay in continuous sunlight so that they don't have to power down overnight. Other projects are <laughs> really fun, like the Titan submarine, which is literally a concept to send a submarine to Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, and have it explore all the lakes of methane and ethane there. The really cool thing about NIAC, though, is that anyone can apply to NIAC. So you don't have to work at NASA, you don't need to have any experience in space exploration. You can actually apply your concepts to NIAC yearly and actually try and come up with new concepts that can transform the future of space exploration. But my all-time favorite project since going on this journey has been Science Hack Day. And Science Hack Day is a two-day, all-night event in which scientists, designers, developers, and people from all different disciplines and backgrounds get together in the same physical space to see what they can rapidly prototype with science in 24 consecutive hours. So the mission of Science Hack Day is really to get excited and make things with science. And Science Hack Day was really born out of a frustration that there's a lot of science data that is being made open, but no one's really playing around with it. No one's building interfaces to it. No one's interacting with it, really. And so not until people can play around with all of this open science data stuff that's out there is it truly accessible for people from all different backgrounds and disciplines. And so I organized Science Hack Days in San Francisco, which is a great event that happens here every year. 
but I also help people around the world create Science Hack Days. And Science Hack Day is actually open for anyone to create. It's an, a grassroots move, movement that anyone can create in their own city. And so over the last couple of years, I've had the great pleasure of uh, visiting a lot of different countries like Colombia and Madagascar and Russia and China. And actually, Science Hack Day as of this year will be in 25 different countries, which is really exciting. <laughs> So I wanted to share with all of you just a few of the weird, fun, interesting ideas that come out of Science Hack Day. So this is one of them. This is a typeface in which a typeface someone wanted to create in which all of the letters had equal wind drag. <laughs> I don't know why, but this was a physicist who was playing with typography. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's fun, and that's something actually we encourage at Science Hack Day, that it's not just about people playing around with science, but it's also about scientists playing around with tech and design and all different types of things. And so what you're looking at here is a makeshift wind tunnel, and someone actually recorded uh, the wind drag of each individual letter and then weighted each individual letter so that all the letters had equal wind drag. So if you want a typeface in which all of the letters have equal wind drag, it looks something like this. <laughs> Another fun hack to come out of Science Hack Day is this, which is a lamp that would light up every time an asteroid passed by the Earth. So in a sense, it was like a near-death lamp. <laughs> Asteroids actually pass by the Earth fairly often, but someone actually hooked up this lamp to a, a live data set of that, and they put it on their desk, and so they could freak out their coworkers every time it would light up by diving under their desk. Another fun hack was called Satellite Symphony. And Satellite Symphony is a, a website where you can go in and you can type in your location anywhere in the world, and it'll tell you what satellites are currently overhead. But it won't just tell you what satellites are currently overhead, it will also put those satellites to music based on how far away they are and how fast they're moving. And what I love so much about this is that when you're at home or you're at work, you're usually hearing how congested it is outside with traffic. You have an ambient awareness of how busy it is outside or how quiet it is outside, but you don't really have that sense for what's over your head at any given point. And so that's what Satellite Symphony does. But my favorite, favorite hack <laughs> from Science Hack Day is the beard detector, which is literally a device someone wanted to create that would detect when he needed to shave. I don't know why, but at Science Hack Day, we don't give people challenges. We really leave it open-ended for people to collaborate and come up with weird collisions and ideas. So this was amusing um, <laughs> of a, a idea of a hack. And so what this person did is they actually used a USB microscope, like you can see here, and they held it up to their face, and they got this really gross image of all the stubble on their face. <laughs> it's really disgusting. <laughs> but they wrote some basic code and used an open computer vision library, and the result they got was this. As you can see, it's saying no beard found, no beard found, and then it's trying to draw lines around the stubble and tell him when he needs to shave. <laughs> now, again, I wasn't quite sure what this had to do with science, but we leave everything open-ended. But Sitting in the audience and seeing this hack demoed for the first time was a particle physicist. And when the particle physicist saw this hack demoed, he said to himself, wow, that's actually a genius way for how to detect cosmic rays in a cloud chamber. <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, it sounds funny until you see what cosmic rays in a cloud chamber look like. And so following Science Hack Day, this particle physicist ended up uh, creating a multi-year research program around detecting cosmic rays in cloud chambers based on the original code and open computer vision library someone used to detect whether or not they needed to shave. And so this is what I love so much about hacking and, and hacking space exploration and, and science hack day is it, it's really about creating sparks for future ideas and future collaborations and future cool stuff. So to me, when you think about space exploration, there's a lot of things that you could be searching for. You could be searching for extraterrestrials, you could be searching for exoplanets, but to me it's really the search for experimentation that's so incredibly precious, and I think we found it through hacking space exploration. Thank you.